This is the New England Journal of Medicine COVID-19 update for June 17th, 2020. I'm Stephen Morrissey, Managing Editor of the Journal, and I'm talking with Eric Rubin, Editor-in-Chief, and Lindsay Baden, Deputy Editor. Eric and Lindsay, as the epidemic has slowed in many parts of the world, people are going back to work, they're entering other settings where transmission can occur. And in fact, the most recent reports are showing a distinct uptick in cases in certain parts of the United States. Several countries around the world still haven't hit their first peak of disease. Over the past few weeks, we've talked a lot about the illness, treatment, prevention, but we haven't discussed transmission in a while. What are we learning about transmission that's new? Well, this week we published the final report, which had come out online earlier, describing transmission in the country of Iceland. Iceland is an unusual place that makes it particularly suited to study transmission. First off, it's an island and it's fairly isolated so that there are in a limited number of introductions of the disease into the population. And it's also an epicenter of genetic research, generally genetics of chronic diseases, but that provided an infrastructure to study COVID-19 when it came along. Early on, basically during the month of May, they tested three different sets of people in the country one that was considered to be at high risk, another group that responded to an open invitation, and one might imagine that they may be at somewhat more risk or more concern, and then those who were randomly invited to be tested. At that point, the positivity rate in the high-risk population was about 13%, but it was below 1% for the two low-risk groups. Now, along with those numbers, they made a number of important observations. First, the disease was largely limited to adults, or the infection was largely limited to adults, and children over 10 years old, and there was very little infection among children younger than 10. That might be important because it might suggest that children are not a significant reservoir of disease and may not play a big role in transmission. That's been a concern all along because children are generally asymptomatic. And second, they did whole genome sequencing on many of their isolates, more than 600 isolates. And because there's a little bit of mutation in the virus, there's some genetic drift, that allows individual strains to be traced and to figure out where they came from. And that permits molecular epidemiologic studies. And they found out that the viral sequences, the viral haplotypes, really correlated very strongly with traditional contact tracing. So that provides a tool for following on a person-to-person level how transmission occurs. I mean, I think that, Eric and Steve, the opportunity that these investigators have taken advantage of and that we as a community need to think about how to expand is in defining transmission, we have to realize that there are different groups that have different transmission dynamics and how to identify those groups either through testing, which is obviously a core staple of public health and case identification, but also traditional epidemiology and molecular epidemiology. And both of those elements allow a better understanding of the transmission dynamics to be able to block transmission and to do proper contact tracing. And I think these investigators have taken advantage of, on the one hand, very basic tools, on the other hand, applying them in a way that's desperately needed for this pathogen to better understand the transmission dynamics and the populations impacted. I think the issues of high-risk populations and general population, they do show that there is a log difference in prevalence of prior infection And that's also important to understand is which communities are having preferential or higher rate of transmission, because obviously they will need to be targeted. You know, only a limited number of countries have been able to do careful contact tracing. Mostly they're the countries that started early when the number of cases was very low. But when the disease got to the U.S. and Europe, because there wasn't a very rapid response, there were so many cases that contact tracing kind of disappeared. But that's going to be very important moving forward if we're going to prevent new transmission trains. And since the disease has been somewhat limited, at least in the U.S. and some other countries, 
now is the opportunity to take advantage of tools like these, I think. I think that's incredibly important to really reflect on because when there's overwhelming large amounts of transmission, the public health system can barely keep up with diagnosing cases and treating them. And as we've talked about over the last three months, flattening the curve, and now the curve is uh, decreasing, now is the time to really strengthen basic, and I would argue routine public health infrastructure to be able to identify the new cases when there are a limited number, to then do vigorous contact tracing, to be able to stop forward transmission, both through traditional epidemiology and molecular epidemiology. And those are tools that need to be scaled up to combat transmission with this epidemic, this pathogen, but they have to be scaled up when transmission is at an ebb, when it's low, because then you can have the resources to do it. Once transmission goes back up to high levels, it is too overwhelming to the system to be able to properly trace each of those. And we are faced with the clinical care challenges that we have just dealt with, that we're all concerned may come back again if we don't stop forward transmission in a meaningful way. So as we think about the loosening of lockdowns and people going back out into the world, what can Iceland tell us? What do we know about the settings where transmission occurred in Iceland? Well, the pattern of transmission changed over the time of the outbreak, during the time that they were following these cases. At early points, most of the cases occurred in travelers because it was being acquired outside of the country. As time went on, transmissions shifted so that most of it was occurring in the households. And that seemed to be true both by traditional contact tracing, the sort of shoe leather epidemiology, and also by molecular testing. And although a number of cases we don't know where they arose, had they applied the molecular tools that they developed, they probably would have had a good idea about those. But certainly, this gives you the idea that once the virus is introduced, it starts to transmit within close contact settings like the household. I mean, this is basic principle. There has to be introduction of a pathogen. Then there's amplification, dissemination, and further amplification. And what one can learn in Iceland is better understand micro-introductions which molecular epi can help you understand, and then amplification in different communities. And Steve, as you suggest, that amplification is a micro environment dependent. It's different in a hospital environment with or without PPE. It's different in a dormitory, in a senior center, or other congregate settings, including public events such as concerts or rallies. And those types of events can lead to amplification that then amplifies in the communities those individuals go back to, such as their households. And that has to be really understood. And those microenvironments will then also be impacted by public awareness and public health response. So it's quite a dynamic process. The cornerstone is testing to identify cases rapidly and then appropriate epidemiology to be able to understand the transmission dynamics of a given chain or large sets of chains to then put in the proper interventions to stop it. There's little new here from a public health standpoint, but it is very new here because we have been as a global community in a very reactive mode because we had to understand that this was a pathogen. We had to understand how to develop diagnostics. We had to deploy diagnostics. We had to make sure the diagnostics work properly. We had to spread them through the communities to provide access. So it's been quite a dynamic process over the last three to four months. But we have now gotten to a point where I think we have tools, such as our rapid large-scale diagnostics, that can and should be deployed the way public health authorities would like to rather than as a limited reagent, which was a problem back in February, March, and part of April. There's been a lot of discussion of transmission from asymptomatic people, which of course would make control of the disease more difficult. In Iceland, how symptomatic were the infected people? Well, it's a little difficult to tell because um, remember that there were multiple populations here, including people at high risk and who knew they were at high risk and people who had self-referred and therefore they may have had concerns. They were perhaps the worried well. And the evidence for that is that about 90% of people reported symptoms who tested positive 
but about almost a third of people who tested negative also reported symptoms. Now, it's possible that some of those were false negative tests by the RT-PCR assay, but it's difficult to define asymptomatic, especially when it's self-evaluated, as was the case here. So I think this is a difficult population to know that in, and we certainly have had difficulty ascertaining what is a symptom in many cases. Nevertheless, this population did report a fair number of symptoms. But it's always hard to know how to ascribe which symptoms to which illness that people have. And I think there's a difference in symptom recollection in those who feel they're at risk and those who are randomly approached to participate. So, Steve, there are all sorts of variables that have to be carefully weighed. What is clear with this pathogen is it can spread with minimal symptoms. Hence, the very rapid and explosive amplification across many of our communities. We did learn more this week about asymptomatic infection from one of the earliest large outbreaks outside China. As many listeners will remember, the cruise ship Diamond Princess was found to have many infected passengers and crew after it docked in Japan. Eventually, there was widespread testing, and more than 700 passengers were found to be infected. So what did we learn this week from those who had no symptoms? There was a very interesting observational study, Steve, done in Japan, where after there was widespread testing on the ship, a number of asymptomatic people were identified. And eventually, rather than leaving them on the ship, they decided to transfer them all to various facilities around the country. The report that we have this week came from one of these facilities near Nagoya, which received a total of 96 passengers and crew and 32 of their uninfected cabin mates who remained together with that group. Of those 32, eight of them subsequently tested positive. The group was probably representative of what you might expect on a cruise ship. There was a mixture of passengers and crew, but by the looks of the demographics, the passengers were largely older. More than half of the entire group were over 65. A quarter of them had comorbid illnesses that would have put them at some risk. And presumably the 32 crew members were younger, and that appears in this sort of bimodal group of passengers by demographics. So of these people, several of whom were, we'd think, at high risk for developing severe disease, only 11 of them developed symptoms. And these were very carefully screened. So now we have a better idea of what's symptomatic and what's asymptomatic. And those people who develop symptoms usually develop symptoms within a week of their first positive test. Now, the traditional risk factors clearly came into play because the people who did develop illness were generally older and much more likely to have a comorbid illness. Those who remained asymptomatic tended to convert their viral assays, the RT-PCR swabs, to negative within a week. But there was a long tail of persistent positivity on these tests, and that was much more striking in people who were symptomatic than people who were asymptomatic. So this suggests that there are a lot of asymptomatic people out there, and most of them won't progress to disease, even in a high-risk population like this. And I think this has been borne out by some of the observations in nursing homes. Nursing homes, many of them have been devastated by this illness with many infections and many deaths. But when systematic sampling has been done, which has been done rarely in the general population, in some of these homes, almost 100% of residents are infected. And yet, these people who are at the very highest risk, all of them are elderly, almost all of them have comorbid illnesses, many of them never get sick. And in some cases, the majority never get sick. So asymptomatic people are out there. One other lesson is that they're likely transmitting, as Lindsay already mentioned, because there was ongoing transmission in this population among the previously uninfected cabin mates. I agree, Eric, that there are two important observations in this report. The burden or prevalence of asymptomatic individuals when aggressively screened and monitored. So they were carefully monitored because of the known nature of the exposure on the Diamond Princess. And that affords us some insight into the asymptomatic or minimally symptomatic frame that individuals with active infection have. The other piece is the duration of PCR positivity 
in many of these individuals, not all of them, but some of them remain PCR positive out to two, three weeks and potentially beyond with a diminishing viral load if one can look at the CT count or the number of cycles on the PCR machine as a marker of the amount of virus present. So there is a diminishment of the amount of virus present, but there is virus present in a significant number of individuals for weeks. Whether or not this is live virus and transmissible is still a debatable issue, but it does remind us that not only there may be those who are asymptomatic, but the duration of shedding needs to really be clearly defined so we can better understand the risk of transmission over time in those who have become infected. I think that I'd stress the fact, Lindsay, that the epidemiology clearly suggests that transmission occurs largely at the beginning of infection or even in pre-symptomatic individuals, and that there is not much evidence of transmission from people who are late. Now, I'll certainly admit that these are not great data, that there's no perfect way to assess infectivity, but I don't want people to walk away thinking that there's a group of people who can transmit forever. We haven't seen evidence of that, even though there are people who are PCR positive for very extended periods of time. And Eric, I think your point's well taken, and thank you for clarifying. There have been some reports that have looked at the ability to culture virus two, three weeks after positivity, and largely the culturable virus implying infectivity as early as prior to illness and early in illness. So you're absolutely correct. These data suggest that viral nucleic acid can persist for weeks. And we need to make sure we fully understand the implications of this, but that the data to date largely suggests that infectivity is before illness or early in the illness. You're absolutely correct. Nevertheless, there is a pool of people who we largely are not identifying who are asymptomatic, who as on the cruise ship can transmit. And that includes both people who are asymptomatic, which was the majority of this group, and pre-symptomatic, the people who went on to develop disease, which was the minority here. And we do ignore this at our peril, I think. We need to be coming up with control measures in contrast to SARS, where the people who are transmitting were sick and it was relatively easy to identify them and isolate them, it's much more difficult in this disease. And so I think we need to have control measures that take that into account. And that's part of as we increase societal transactions, which is very important, we need to continue to bear in mind the burden of potential silent transmission, which gets back to, Steve, the point just about thinking about transmission and the public health response to prevent it from having uh, second waves or increased surges in different communities because of the individuals who may have little to no symptoms who are potentially infectious for a period of time. So in fact, what does all this mean for strategies to try to limit the spread of infection? How do we develop those strategies? So I think that it means a couple of things. Because asymptomatic people are important, we need to have some way of controlling those people. And there are sort of two general categories of doing that. One is to just isolate or quarantine all contacts. That was the strategy that China chose to take, and it worked. They really quarantined them. They would send them off to facilities, uh, remove them from households where most transmission occurs, and send them off to facilities to wait out their quarantine periods. Alternatively, we can be doing a lot more testing, and that's been the strategy that's been employed in places like Korea and Singapore. And although the testing is imperfect, that can substitute for some of those quarantine measures and be effective. But to ignore that population, I think, means that we'll have a lot more transmission. Steve, from my perspective, it's a very simple answer, testing. And testing to scale. And that is something that I think we as a community, a global community, a national community, a local community, have to think long and hard about what testing means to scale, to block transmission, and to protect our most vulnerable members. But testing to scale is not thousands. It's probably hundreds of thousands.
and it's serial testing because I may not be infected today, but I may be infected two weeks from now. And how to have rational strategies that can allow proper surveillance to identify a case and then move in and really stop transmission in whichever community that case is identified. Thank you, Lindsay. Thank you, Eric.